Hi, I'm Nick Raines from Leica Camera Australia. You've probably got the impression from my previous video that I'm pretty keen on this new Leica Q3. So let me explain to you how I've set the menus up in this camera and I'll explain to you as well the reasons behind those changes. All right, let's have a look at the menus. Hopefully you can see that okay. It should be nice and sharp. As you can see on the back of the camera here, this is your main menu that you should access by simply pressing the menu button on the back of the camera. This is what the first thing that you'll see. You have the, the mode, the exposure mode, you have the f-stop, you have the shutter speed, you have the ISO, and a whole bunch of these little icons down here, and I'll explain what those mean in a sec. So let's just go through all of the settings, and I'll show you exactly how I've set up the camera, because some of the settings that are set by default are not my choice, and I have reasons why I might make those changes. Across the top of the screen, the right-hand side, you'll see that there are six pages. And each time you press the menu button, it will go to the next page. So it's like a shortcut to the next page. You can, of course, use the up and down buttons on the rocker switch here. So if I, I can go down and when I go off the bottom of the page, it goes to page two and so on. Let's go back to page one and we'll start off at the top with the drive mode. Um, this is simply the way the camera shoots when you hold the shutter button down. I generally have it set to single frame because I don't shoot a lot of action. Uh, I don't tend to shoot things that are fast moving and if I do I want to time my shot. So I prefer to use single shot but there are a lot of other options here. You'll see the description in the menu. This one is two frames a second or four frames a second here. Now you'll also notice that it says 14 bit AF. So at its highest quality settings, the camera is limited to four frames per second. That's with the full phase detect autofocus and shooting in 14 bit RAW. When you go to the higher settings, it drops back to 14 bit RAW without the autofocus. So you can't track using the phase detect at the high frame rate. You can shoot a lot of frames that are the same. The autofocus will give you the first shot, but the next sequence of frames, it won't do it. That's just the nature of the camera, the nature of the super high resolution files. There's a limit to how much this processor can keep up with the data flow of more pictures being taken over and over again. If you go off the bottom, there's a couple more. So don't miss these. There's the, that first page of the drive mode settings is only one page. There's a second page. So I've just gone use the down button to go to the next page. This is something that I will definitely use quite a bit, interval shooting for time lapses. So if we go into that, you can see the, the number of frames that you're gonna shoot, the interval between them and a countdown before you start. So for instance, if I was doing a time lapse, I might set 600 frames, which would give me about 20 seconds worth of video footage later. And then the interval between them, I generally use three seconds, but depends on the subject. and. Time lapses are, of course, a whole different topic, but at least you can do them with this camera. Coming back out of that menu to exposure bracketing, this is something I use a lot. So we'll go into that with a right click. Number of frames, I generally do three. EV steps, definitely one is not enough. I would much prefer to see people use three or two, sorry, two frames. Three is probably too much for one stop, one step. If you were doing five frames, you might do one and a half steps, but I do three. So it's plus two, normal and minus two. And this works for me in most circumstances. It's my fallback technique when the contrast is super high and I want to capture the whole dynamic range with much higher quality than a single frame can possibly do. Even given the camp that this camera has got a phenomenal dynamic range, sometimes you do need an auto bracket. Um, auto set that exposure compensation we can leave alone because we can override it later we'll come back to that and automatic means it shoots the three frames with one press of the button not one press per frame so you'd have to count one two three if you put it on automatic one press one two three and then it's done that's the way to me it makes much more sense to do it that way all right next so that's the drive mode this may be a long video because there's an awful lot of options to talk about here Self-timer, wonderfully, the designers of this camera have separated the self-timer from the drive mode menu. On some of the other cameras, the self-timer is in the drive mode. So if you want to do some sort of long exposure, it's very, very difficult to do it with the time uh, self-timer set instead of using some sort of remote release like the, the Leica Photos app. I love the fact that this has the self-timer that I can choose independently of everything else. It's wonderful. Uh, I tend to use it on a tripod with a two-second self-timer that I can just press and then wait, take my hands away, and then it will count down one, two, and shoot. 
If you're doing a group picture with you in it, then 12 seconds is a, a nice time to run back to your position and smile. Okay, focusing. Focus mode, intelligent AF. I generally don't use that. I much prefer to have my camera set to do the sorts of things that I want it to do. And in this particular case, I'm going to change this to AFS. AFS is AF single frame. So you, when you press the shutter button, you'll see the little green box go to green and it'll lock. And whilst you hold your shutter button halfway down, that focus will not change. If you lift your finger and then move it down again, take up that half pressure, it will refocus. But I want to take single frames. Continuous, we'll talk about. Uh, okay, so that's AFS. Going down the modes, we have a considerable number of different focus modes of how it actually looks for what is going to be in focus. First one is multi-field. I don't recommend this one because it chooses what part of the picture the camera thinks is the most interesting and focuses on that. Well, I think I should be choosing what part of the picture is the most important, not the camera. With all due respect to the sophistication of such a camera, it's my decision. So I will generally use field, which gives you a box which you can move around the frame, which I'll show you. I just go into field, come out of menus. You'll see that you can move this little field around the screen like this. And that is what it will focus on. And one thing that's not terribly obvious is if I actually press and hold, you'll should see two little arrows and then I can pinch and resize and move that around and then register that. So I can change that field box a little bit if I want to. Let's go back to the menus, focusing, focus mode. So field is my choice. The second one that I use, and this is when this this is when the AFC, AF continuous would come into play, is if you want to track somebody's face or body. Okay, so when I'm doing videos, and I'll do a different video about the video settings um, in the future, but when you're in video mode, having this follow somebody's eyes is really useful, and that's when you want AFC, AF continuous in play. For stills, it works absolutely fine, but I tend to use the, my shutter button to focus and then shoot rather than actually have it continuously focusing. But that's just me. Again, you may choose to do things slightly differently. Okay, that's the focus modes. Then exposure metering into there. Four exposure modes, as you can see, one, two, three, four. Spot is tricky to use unless you know exactly what you're doing and exactly what you want to point that spot at. You'll find it's astonishingly twitchy and you've only got to let that spot focus drift onto something bright or something dark and your exposure will go all over the place. So this is something to be used in certain circumstances when you know what you're doing. Center weighted is the sort of classic Leica way of metering and that just basically emphasizes the center of the frame. So as you're looking at the screen here, it would be sort of an area like I'm describing now with my hands. That would be the emphasis for the metering. It's easy to fool by things like these bright windows behind me. So again, it's a little sensitive to what you point it at. Highlight weighted is an interesting option. The idea is it protects the highlights against overexposure. I have found, again, with all due respect to the designers, that it's a little twitchy. And if you have something very bright in the shot, uh, like the sun <laughs> or a, a light on the wall or something, it will tend to emphasize protecting that highlight. Now, some highlights shouldn't be protected because they're going to blow out because you'll end up getting a, a very underexposed picture for the rest of the image. Now, I appreciate the intent behind this, but for me, the fourth option, which is multi-field, is the one I use. And this basically measures different parts of the picture all over and it ignores things that are way off the scale, like these windows behind me will generally ignore those because it's too bright but it will tend to emphasize my face and my body and so on. So it's much harder to fool. It gets you into the ballpark much quicker. However, if you've seen any of my previous videos about metering, I did a whole series of videos about take better photographs. There's a, a one of those episodes there is about exposure and metering. And you'll find out in there that I don't really use the metering modes when I am shooting. I'm using highlight flashing, uh, highlight warning, the flashing when you in the screen that you see when something's overexposed and exposure compensation. So really, if you're using that technique, these metering modes don't actually matter. But by default, I have it on multi-field metering and that will get you into the ballpark much quicker than any other metering mode. 
Exposure compensation, you don't need to really access this through the menus because you can access it through the wheel on the top where my forefinger is here on my right hand. That will give you exposure compensation directly. So again, I don't need that in the menus. Auto ISO, just come back to, I've just gone too far, there we go down auto ISO now this is where you can set the camera to be on auto ISO mode or a locked ISO so for instance I can set it to 400 here the um, accessing it through the menus is a bit slow I'll come to the custom buttons in a sec because I choose to have this on a custom button rather than having to delve into the menus each time to change it but that's what this menu option does so let's go back to the main menu and go down one which takes us to page number two and the top one of that is auto ISO settings. And this is important because auto ISO is a very, very useful technique, very useful setting to use to protect you from making mistakes to do with too low a shutter speed for hand holding. That's what it's for. So let's just have a look at that. I generally leave the maximum ISO on. And this is the, uh, remember, each time I show you a new menu setting, this is the default that the camera will give you out of the box and I'm going to change a lot of these so out of the box it will show maximum ISO 6400 first of all this camera is really good at high ISO so this is a very conservative setting but I'm going to set this to maximum 100,000 because I want the camera to give me a good exposure regardless of the lighting conditions and if I limit the ISO you'll often end up with pictures with us with a, a shutter speed that's lower than you might imagine because uh, it by limiting it to say 6,400, what happens when you are f1.7 and your shutter speed needs to be below your threshold, which is this shutter speed limit here, well, what will happen is the camera will override that threshold and you'll end up with a lower shutter speed than you thought. So by setting this second option here, and I'm going to choose a fixed amount, 125th here, Depends what you're shooting. This is a little bit tricky, but 125th will give you a good exp good sharp image under most circumstances. Again, nothing to do with subject movement. So if you're shooting something fast moving, 125th won't work. But this is the lower limit of what the camera will shoot at when the lighting conditions change. If you've got more light than you need, the shutter speed will be higher. But when the light levels drop and you're in aperture priority mode, then you'll find that this is a lower threshold. However, Going back to my point about the maximum ISO at the top of the screen there, if the light drops below the point where 125th at f1.7 is not enough, and your ISO maximum is set to 6400, let's say, what will happen is the camera will override the lower shutter speed limit and you risk camera shake. It won't just underexpose. That's why I set that top level to 100,000. So I've got the maximum sensitivity out of the camera. I'd much rather have a noisy picture at high ISO than a, a, a shot that I took at too low a shutter speed and I've got camera shake because I can't fix that. The flash, not using flash, so I'm not really going, going to go into that at all. Next one down, white balance. I think we all understand what white balance is. I'm shooting raw all the time, so my white balance I can choose later. I tend to leave this on daylight. Um, the only time I would set this and be very, very careful about when I'm setting it is when I'm shooting video, because video isn't like isn't like raw stills. You can't set the white point later. Um, you can adjust for it to a certain degree, but if you get the white point miles off in video, you've got a real problem. Okay, photo file format. You have the choice of DNG or DNG plus JPEG or just JPEG. I tend to shoot only DNG files. But under certain circumstances, I will put it onto DNG plus JPEG. And the reason behind that is twofold. One, if you're shooting in black and white mode, which we'll get to in a sec, you will see a black and white view in the viewfinder and you will see a black and white result when you preview the shot after you've taken it. OK, because it's creating that black and white JPEG. If you're shooting raw, it will show you it will show you black and white as well. But you will uh, you will get a color raw file when you open it into Lightroom. The defaults in Lightroom will override the defaults saying black and white here, and it will flick to color. If you shoot the JPEG, you've got a reference point. Also, if you're shooting using the digital zoom, the cropping, when you shoot only in raw, when you've shot the picture, even though you've used the crop, the preview that you see will be the full image. 
If you shoot DNG plus JPEG in crop mode, the preview that you see after you've taken the picture will be the cropped version. So you can see what you had in mind when you shot it. It's a subtle thing, but it's quite useful. DNG resolution, you've got large, medium and small, which is 60 megapixels, 36 megapixels and 18 megapixels. The benefit of the lower resolution files is that you have a slightly higher dynamic range. Now, it's measurable for sure, but it's not always visible. And I would much rather have the full 60 megapixels of data in terms of image quality than one theoretical step of dynamic range. It's uh, my emphasis is always going to be on resolution rather than dynamic range, which is always going to be good anyway. It's, you know, 14 or 15. I mean, really, it's it's not that visible in the final shot. So I just leave it on 60 megapixels and have done with it. JPEG settings. Um, if you're shooting RAW plus JPEG for reference pictures, you might choose to set the JPEGs a little smaller. But to be honest, the difference in size is, you know, it's not that great compared to a 80 megapixel DNG file. So if you are really short of disk space, well, maybe you need to buy some more disks. <laughs> so I tend to leave that on large just because I can. Now you've got noise reduction. This is purely for JPEG. So all of these settings only affect JPEGs. They do not affect raw files. So if you're not shooting anything other than raw files, you can ignore all of this stuff. Okay. But if you do want to shoot JPEGs, then these settings will be important. I would tend to use low noise reduction because you don't have much control over it. And the noise reduction in Lightroom is so much more sophisticated than any camera noise reduction that you're much better off doing it in post. So I'll leave that on low. Film style. Now, this is interesting. If you go into that, we've got standard, vivid, natural, monochrome, monochrome, high contrast, and then the settings of each one. Again, these only affect the JPEG setting, and also it will affect the view on the back of the camera when you're shooting and in the viewfinder, because you are kind of looking at a JPEG when you're looking at the camera, uh, the viewfinder, and on the back of the camera. So I'll leave that on standard. The one that I do like a lot, though, is the monochrome high contrast because that gives you this lovely black and white sort of tri-x look from film days and it's excellent and if you're shooting in even if you're shooting in dng mode you still get now a black and white viewfinder which gives you a chance to preview what you're shooting it's really nice but remember this does not affect raw files so you will always get a color raw file if you're shooting only raw if you shoot raw plus jpeg you'll get a black and white jpeg and a color raw file Okay, oh, we can actually change the settings of these. And if I go to my high contrast one, you'll see that you've got some settings down the bottom, contrast, highlight, shadow, sharpness, and so on. Now, I would strongly recommend that if you go to the, the sharpness, that you do reduce that. Maybe minus two is the minimum, zero is default. I'd bring that down to maybe minus one. This is if you're going to use the JPEG later. This has, again, nothing to do with the raw files, but if you are going to shoot JPEGs and use them, baked in sharpness can be a problem if you do a big print. Because if you over aggressively sharpen an image and then enlarge it to nice and big, like this one, hang on, which side there, that one on, on the easel, there, there it is. <laughs> Um, you'll find that the sharpening uh, effects are quite visible. You get little white halos around things. It's not pretty. So best not to do that. So if you are using JPEGs, maybe be a little bit conservative on the sharpening. Okay, we've got scene mode coming up next. Now, this is something that I just don't use. I just leave it on PASM, which is Program, Aperture Priority, Manual, or sorry, Shutter Speed, Priority, or Manual. Those are the settings that I use because I have full control. All of the rest of them are a kind of auto modes with different priorities, and I just don't work like that. So feel free to use them if they help you, but for me, I'm just gonna move on because it's not something that's relevant to the way I shoot. All right, next page, page three making progress here. Um, image stabilizer, uh, the image stabilizer is in the lens. There's a lens element which is stabilized and you can have it on automatic. You can have it on, on, on all the time or you can turn it off. Personally, I leave it, I'm gonna change this and I'm gonna turn it on because as far as I can tell, there is no downside to leaving it on all the time. If you shoot on tripod, there is a possibility that it will try and stabilize by moving the element around, even though the camera's not moving, it's looking for movement and could possibly degrade the image. Personally, I've never noticed that happening even when I've forgotten to turn off the stabilizer. So if you want to be particularly careful, maybe turn it off, but 
like I said, I've not noticed a problem. So I just leave that turned on and that's that. No need to change it again. Photo aspect ratio, I leave that on three to two, which is the entire sensor. So it's three across, two down, 6,000 by 4,000. If it was a 24 megapixel sensor, I don't know exactly the number of pixels on this camera off the top of my head. 6,000 by 4,000 is three to two. That gives you an idea of the proportions, but it's basically number of pixels across the top by the number of pixels down the side. Three to two is the full sensor. You can change that to various sensor size, uh, various sensor proportions. Four to three is a bit like old five by four film, uh, slightly more square. You've got one to one, which is square, and then you've got 16 to nine, which is of course the, your classic video widescreen TV effect. Um, personally, I would do all of that in post and I will leave that on three to two. Perspective control, um, this is something that you, you, you will use occasionally. If you're photographing something with strong verticals and you have to tilt the camera up, you'll probably notice that those verticals do this. The perspective control will give you a little box uh, in the viewfinder and it will correct those verticals. It will show you what that box is going to be doing and it will show you how the subject fits within your new framing, if you like. So you'll see in your results that those verticals have been corrected so that they are now vertical rather than tilted like this. Something that it's kind of obvious when you play with it. Um, I did a video about it when it first came out in the M10, M10R with one of the firmware upgrades. So if you want more details about that, have a look at that video on our channel. Shutter type hybrid I've got uh, is, the, tr is the, the default setting. We can leave that alone. Basically what that means is up to two thousandth of a second. I think it's either two or four. It, it can be mechanical shutter. And then after that, it becomes an electronic shutter because an electronic shutter can work up to higher shutter speeds, 16,000th in this case. Downside is that with an electronic shutter, which means that there is no shutter darkening the sensor, it basically turns the sensor on and off very quickly. You do lose a theoretical amount of dynamic range. Now, Honestly, I've never noticed because it's very hard to measure the difference between, say, 14 and 15 stops of dynamic range. It's really subtle in the shadows and the camera is already so good. So the electronic shutter just have just go higher. I leave it on hybrid. So it's mechanical up to uh, 2000 and then it's up to 16000. It's electronic up to you. The interesting thing is that when you shoot up to 2000, you'll hear a noise when you shoot. When you shoot above that with the electronic shutter, it makes no noise whatsoever. You actually have to set the camera to make an acoustic signal so that you know you've taken the picture. It's kind of weird when you take the shot and it's almost like nothing's happened. Okay, that's that. Uh, flash settings, we're not using flash. Exposure preview. This is essentially, if you are shooting in a studio using studio flash, you would set this to PAS, not PASM, so that when you're in manual mode, which is what you would be if you're shooting in the studio, you get an exposure preview kind of automatically generated rather than a preview of the actual exposure if that makes sense. So if you're shooting F8 at a 250th of a second in the studio, you're going to get a black shot because there's simply not enough light. But if you put it onto PAS and shoot in manual, the camera will give you a, 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 a view on the back of the camera, which basically means you can see what you're shooting. If you don't turn that on, it, you'll just get, it'll just look black because it's trying to preview the exposure you've set in a circumstance which is too dark. By turning it to PAS, it overrides that and the camera will give you an image on the back of the screen. So it's specifically for studio shooting. So we'll leave that alone. Auto review, which is an interesting one. This is, interestingly enough, this is set to off. And I did reset the camera before I started this video. And I'm surprised to see that as off. Often it's set to three seconds or one second. And that means that when you shoot the picture, it immediately shows you a preview. So if you're shooting with your eye to the viewfinder, rather than see what happens next, you'll see what you just shot. So my advice to people is to always either turn it off here or very usefully with shutter button press. So that means that if you shoot the picture and hold, you will see the preview. But if you shoot the picture and release, you'll now look through the camera again, ready for the next shot. So if you want to be very careful about something and check your shot, just hold your finger down. I find that quite useful. So I tend to have it set to shutter button pressed. Long exposure noise reduction is on by default. What this does is if you are shooting beyond a second or so, the camera will take a second exposure with the shutter closed 
and then it will subtract those two images which reduces the noise because noise is random and if you have two images that were shot with the same noise the noise will be different places between the two pictures it tends to cancel out so it does work really well but the problem is or problem the the drawback is that if you shoot a 30 second exposure you then have to wait another 30 seconds before the camera can be triggered again to take your next picture so you have a trade-off there um, you will see some noise if you turn this off for long exposures but at least you can shoot again and you can control that noise in post maybe so how you use this is up to you if you are wanting the result to be easily accessible without doing much post processing on is a good idea and if you're not in a hurry to shoot more pictures but if you're shooting five minute exposures to get that lovely sort of when those clouds blur and so on waiting a further five minutes is a real problem as you can imagine so i'd turn this on or off depending on what i'm shooting but that's what it's doing it's great that we have the choice customized controls all right so there's a lot here um first of all you if edit favorites if you go into this menu you'll see that these are all turned off because they are all turned off, there is no favorites menu. But if you turn some of these on between your first and second, between your after your first press of the menus. So if I go, well, let me just turn one and I'll show you. So let's go to customize control favorites. I'm just going to turn on drive mode. So that now says on. I hope you can see. Now, when I come out of the menus to the normal view and I hit menu once and then again, I get a, an extra you see at the top there, there's a little star. That's my favorites. It didn't exist before because I had no favorite set. But now I've got my drive mode, which is the one I turned on. And this will show you any of those settings that you've got turned on as a kind of shortcut to menu items that you use more frequently. So rather than having to go to page six or five or whatever, it will be accessible here. Now, personally, I don't use it because I don't really access the menus very often. I tend to use the custom buttons, which we'll come to in a sec, but that's what it's doing. This will not show if I go back into the menu and I go to customize control and I go to edit favorites and then I turn off the drive mode. So there are now no favorites set. When I come out of here now and go to menu and then menu, I'm straight into the menus and that little star at the top there has disappeared because there are no favorites set. OK, now we've got the function buttons. Now, I am not going to show you how these work here because there was a much better way. Just give you just a quick taste. If I click onto function button one, this is giving me all of the options that I could choose later. It will turn out every single menu item is turned on at this point. I can shut them all off because when I come out of the menus and this is custom button one here where my finger is. If I long press this, I now get a list of choices and all of the ones that were turned on in that other menu under customized controls are available to me here. So if I limit it to only three, I'll only see three things here. But if I turn off all but three, I'll only see three options here. I tend to set and forget these buttons, so I don't really change them very often so I just have all options available all the time it seems to me to be a little bit um, too much customization for me so in this particular case I've got this left hand custom button set to digital zoom which is that crop if I come out of there again custom button 2 which is the one to the right by default that is swapping to video mode and what you're looking at now is the video mode there's my voice on the audio there's my video settings here and so on. And you access those settings through different menus, which I will talk about in a different video. But that toggles between photo and video. You could also toggle between the two if I come to the norm menu and you can simply dab there and there just to put it back into photo mode. But you've got the option to toggle it here. Now, I will change this because having shot with this camera for many months now, I've found that it's really easy to knock this with your nose or whatever. And you may find that when you pick the camera up, it's in video mode, which is really irritating. So I tend to change that to ISO. Now, by default, this button at the top is on ISO. At the moment, it's set to auto, but I can change my ISO to 400 or something there. That's this button here. But I'm going to hold, long hold this. And I'm going to change this to 
and I'm not quite sure which direction I've got to go to. I want to, there we are, photo video set. So I've now duplicated these two buttons. So I'm going to go back to this button, custom button two, long press that, and I'm going to go to ISO, which I'm hoping is the opposite direction. There it is. So that now is the ISO button. So if I press that once, it takes me to the ISO menu. So I've got the photo video toggled on this button here, and I've got the ISO toggled on this button here. There is another custom button here as well. And in this particular case, I've got that set to toggle info levels. And what that means is if I come out of the menus and I click this, you'll see the information go from a clean screen to just the basics across the bottom and the histogram, and then to the, or some icons which show you what menu settings I've got. So you've got the option to flick through. You may choose to change that. Now, this would be a good time to explain how this button could be repurposed to give you a kind of focus lock or a, 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 what they would call rear button focus. The camera doesn't really have it built in like the SL2. And it's something that people have been asking for for quite a long time. But let me just show you how it might work. So I'm going to grab my old Leica 3 as a little test subject because I've got to point the camera at something to show you how this works. So just on the overhead view, I'm going to long press and I'm going to change this to a F, whoops, gone past it, A F L, A F lock. This now subtly changes the behavior of the camera. Now let me just see if I can get this to, if I can demonstrate this well enough. I'm gonna tilt that wonderful tilt screen out and you can see my monitor in the distance and you can also see that Leica 3 in the foreground. Click once to get it sort of set to focus and then click once more to focus lock, which is the green box. It's a two click process rather than a one click process. It's not toggling autofocus precisely like the SL2. It's kind of a halfway house, but it works pretty well. So now it's locked on the camera. It's not focusing on the distance. If I then click my rear thumb, unlock lock, focuses on the screen. And then when I point it at the little three in the foreground and press the shutter button, it won't refocus, look. So it's locked on the screen in the distance. Oops, I pressed it too long. Off, on to focus, there we go, that's better. And then click, click, refocuses, do that again. There we go. And then if I use my shutter button to, to try and focus in the distance, it won't work. Click, off, click on to lock, there we go. Won't refocus on the foreground, because I'm pressing my shutter button here, but click off, click on, and it focuses on the camera, and it's not refocusing. So I can reframe this, with the focus locked. I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit, it, it makes a lot more sense when you actually have the camera in your hands to do it. The rear button basically will trigger the autofocus and lock it and then unlock it and it's ready to refocus. So that green box means it's locked. And if I click the button, it will go to white. It's now ready to focus with either my shutter button or my rear button. And now it's gone green, it's locked. And if I press my shutter button, it won't refocus. And the whole idea is that you're taking the focusing function away from the shutter button. That's what rear, focus, rear button focus is all about. There's a lot to go through. All right, moving along. So on the back here, we're still in customized controls. We've been through function button one, two. We've talked about long pressing on the, sh on the custom buttons. Wheel assignment, which is an interesting one. This allows me to choose the function of the rear wheel here. Now, when it's on auto, the function depends on what mode the camera's in. I prefer that to be locked into one function, and that is exposure compensation. I've got ISO set on a different function, which is this little button here, but now I want that to be exposure compensation. And now when I dial the dial, you should see at the bottom here, that little tiny indicator on the bottom is moving left and right. And that is my exposure conversation. So that's always available under my right thumb. That's where I want it. Okay, digital zoom. This is something that you would choose using custom button one here, toggle through the settings rather than here. You can, if you want to choose it here, but for me, it's much more uh, user friendly to, to actually click through with the button itself. Be aware that you have to go through the whole sequence. So you have to go 28, 35, 50, 75, 90, then back to 28. You can't go backwards and forwards. You just have to loop through the whole sequence. 
User profile, you can save all your settings as a user profile. Um, some people might uh, be sharing the camera with somebody else and they have the camera set up in different ways. Or you might have, let's say, different auto ISO settings if you're shooting sport or landscapes and you might have a landscape and a sport mode or something. Personally, I don't use user profiles. It's just me using it. I set the camera up, up once and I leave it alone. Capture assistance, you have the option to have a grid on the back of the screen, which is turned off. I'm just going to turn them all on so you can see what's going on. So now on the back of the screen, it's not that's my that red line is my level grid. If I move the camera, you'll see now that goes green when it's level. I'm not pointing at any. There it is. That's level. I've got it flat on the desk, so that's why the screen's black. You've got a composing grid for your rule of thirds. You've got a histogram in the top right hand corner. There's also focus peaking is turned on when you're in manual mode. Display settings, um, EVF or LCD. This means that if it's in automatic, when you put your eye to the viewfinder, you see through the viewfinder and you take your eye away from the viewfinder, you see the picture on the back of the screen. You can change that if you want to save battery to EVF extended, and that turns everything off, including the EVF and the LCD until you raise the camera to your eye, then it turns on the EVF only. So normally you'd have the LCD screen on the back of the camera on all the time, which uses batteries. This means that both electronic viewfinders, because obviously there's two, one on the back, one in the viewfinder, both of those are on continuously. And the bigger of the two is on a lot of the time, even if you're not shooting. So this allows you to put it into a sort of standby mode where the act of raising it to your eye actually starts the EVF displaying, saves batteries. So I tend to, I tend to use that when I really am getting low on battery and I really, and, and I've got no chance of changing batteries. Very, very unusual. The battery lasts a long time on this camera, but it is like a fallback position if you find that you're getting a little bit low and you want to eke out the last bit of battery life that you've got. So I tend to leave that on auto. Sensitivity is how sensitive this is, so how near something needs to be before it triggers the swap from LCD to EVF. Brightness, I tend to leave all the colours and brightnesses on default because I'm not judging the picture by what I see in the viewfinder, I'm judging it purely on the results and the histogram for exposure. Like the photos, I'm not going to go through that now, that's a subject of another video. Camera settings, we can change the default file name. Starts at the moment with L followed by an incrementing number. So L0001, L0002 and so on. You might want to put your name in here and if you want to edit that, you have the option to have a nice little keyboard screen and you can put in say Nick1, Nick2 or, or if you wanted to be really um, you know, particular about it, you could even put in the title of the place that you're photographing or something like that. Personally, I leave it alone because I do all of my file renaming in Lightroom on import. So to me, I just leave this alone. Go back to there. Uh, power saving, interesting. You have the option to have the auto power off uh, after a certain number of minutes and also displays an AF auto off. If you were using this as a webcam, which you could, because there is an HDMI feed, comes out of this little hatch here. There's an HDMI feed in there. You don't want the autofocus to shut down after a couple of minutes. Now, the overhead camera that you're looking through is an SL2S, and I have set the same menu settings in here to off and off. That means it will never power down and never go into power mode because I don't know how long I'm going to be using it for. So basically it's been on for about two hours now whilst I'm recording this video. Obviously in the field, you would probably set this to whatever suits you, a couple of minutes and maybe uh, a minute something like that, up to you. But it gives you the option to stop the camera shutting down at all, which is great for if you're using it as a webcam or you're videoing something. Okay, camera information, just make sure I've finished that. Oh, power saving, acoustic signal, electronic shutter, remember, doesn't make any noise. So you might want to make it choose some sort of, uh, you know, make it make a shutter speed noise here if you wanted to. Camera information, this is all about the firmware. This is an older firmware version, which I must upgrade because there's a new one come out just today. So that's a job for later on. Then language is English. Um, interestingly, it's very difficult to, when we did the training in this, all the cameras were set to default in German. So we had to go through and change all that. So if you are demonstrating the camera to somebody 
whose langu first language is not English, it can be a lot easier for them to understand what you're talking about if you set their menus into their local language and then you can transfer, if you like, the page and the line and say, well, this is the line I'm talking about from your own camera. So if you were talking to someone about their camera, this can be useful. Obviously, in my case, I just leave it on English. Right. Um, just coming back to the menu, your sort of quick menu at the back here. These are all accessible by touchscreen and sliding around. So my ISO, if I tap on that, there's a little slider. Oops, there we go, press it there. There's a little slider here that you can change up and down like that. So again, I tend to use the menus for that or in actual fact access the ISO through my ISO button here. I've just gone into the video mode by mistake. There we go, ISO there, okay. Um, these are fixed, by the way. You get these 10 and that's it. So uh, you've got the uh, autofocus mode, you've got your um, metering mode, you've got your drive mode, you've got your photo, your film styles, you've got your user profiles, you've got your metering mode, you've got your white balance, JPEG and or DNG, you've got your photos app and you've got access to the menu itself. So there's a various ways of doing things. So. There's a lot to change, but I'm hoping that I've given you a pretty good overview of how I've changed the camera to suit me. And once you've changed the camera, that actually might be a good time to use a user profile. Now I said I don't use them very often, mostly because I'm changing this camera all the time and I'm demonstrating things to people. So I never have it in one state. I have to go back and set them afterwards. If I was more organized, and I should listen to my own advice here, I will set my camera up like I've described it to you, save it as, Nick, user profile Nick or something like that. And then when I've mucked around with the camera and changed everything, I can then go back and set it to where I had it before. So it's a nice little fail safe position. Plus, equally importantly, if not more importantly, when you do a firmware upgrade, which resets the whole camera, it does ask you if you want to save your user profiles to the SD card before it does the firmware upgrade. That means you can save the user profiles to a card, take the card out or leave the card in actually, reset the camera and then you're back to default and then you can load that user profile and have the camera back to where you were before without having to go through all the menus like I just did. It's a nice little time saver. All right, well, I hope that gave you some idea of how I'm using the camera, a wonderful little camera. If you have one of these cameras, change it, make a few changes, go out. Hopefully it'll help you shoot better, but, but just go ahead and enjoy the camera. All right, thanks for listening. Talk to you again in the next video.